Okay, so Charlie left me with three minutes. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so I will try to be quick, but maybe not that quick. Um, well, when, when Min asked me to give this talk, I was thinking that what is our expertise here at Alto, and how could we uh, take advantage of that to bring in several groups and to work some, on, on some joint goal? And at the same time, how could we possibly uh, help in advancing large-scale quantum computing or quantum-enhanced computing, as I titled it? So, um, so I want to give you a little bit of motivation what we could do here, what, is still, what are still the open questions. Of course, well, Charlie already gave you a lot of open questions in that, uh, re, uh, in that approach, but I'm talking more about the, um, the superconducting quantum computer approach. So, what is quantum-enhanced computing in general? Well, you know, we have typically classical problems. Um, Typically, our problems can be written in, in, on a piece of paper or, or written in a classical computer. And the idea in quantum-enhanced computing is to take that classical input and use all these degrees of freedom that quantum physics allows us to use to solve that problem and have a classical output in the end. Um, how to do this uh, is not obvious for all problems, but we know that for certain classes of problems, there are very efficient quantum algorithms that can be used to speed up uh, the solution. So, well, then the question is, what is, what is, what is happening here? What is this quantum, uh, quantum machine here? Well, it could be this topological quantum computer, or then it could be, for example, the D-Wave uh, black uh, box, um, which, uh, which is, um, which is a beautiful machine and can do, uh, can do a lot of uh, quantum mechanics simulations. And, or it could be the more traditional sort of superconducting uh, chip, where we have a couple of qubits uh, coupled through these um, uh, transmission line resonators. Well, let me talk to you more about these two particular approaches to quantum computing. So here you have the D-Wave. Uh, so-called adiabatic quantum annealer, and here you have a sort of more traditional type of chip, uh, or a chip that is supposed to be used in a more traditional type of quantum computing. So in this more traditional type of quantum computing, you have logic gates. Basically, you have bits, quantum bits, and then you perform some logic gates on those bits and couple them together and, and do error correction, and that way the computational, computation proce proceeds quite much like in a, in a classical computer, where you do NOT gates or, or XAR gates. Uh, in, in the adiabatic quantum computer, you actually try to stay at the ground state all the time and just steer your Hamiltonian that is describing, that is actually determining the ground state, steer it in a way that in the end, uh, you are solving some problem of in, you know, uh, practical interest. So these two schemes are quite uh, different in that sense, and well, what is the what is the truth is that uh, D-Wave computer has more than 500 qubits, physical qubits, at the moment, uh, and this sort of more traditional quantum computer has uh, has less than 10 qubits. Um, this is because uh, of a different kind of approach. Uh, so, so in this traditional type of quantum computing, the, the chips themselves are designed to be able to do any type of uh, computation, whereas in the D-Wave case, it's, the chip itself is in practice to assess only a certain class of problems. You will hear more about this D-Wave later on, so I will not go into very deep details. Um, so, and if you think about the lifetime of, of the qubits, where you, in the D-Wave case, you work in the crown state, so basically, uh, you have short excitation lifetime quite often. Uh, your computer, well, it doesn't matter because you want to stay at the ground state. It doesn't matter that much. But in this traditional way, uh, you actually work in excited states and you want the qubits to have very long lifetimes. So, so what is very important for actually for both of these approaches is the environment. 
For, uh, so in here, you want to stay in a crown state, so in the environment which help you to stay in a crown state. In here, you actually want to, well, for long, people have been just wanted to get rid of the environment so that you would not, never uh, decay into the crown state or have this decoherence. So, well, I will now go f more into, into explaining what's happened here, how, how, can, how people have been able to make uh, this lifetime longer, or how has it proceed, proceeded. So, but, well, back in 2000, the lifetime was just 10 nanoseconds of the superconducting qubits, and you could basically do one operation to the qubit, and then you had an error. So, we were pretty desperate. We were thinking, this, this is now the most crucial problem that has to be solved to be able to do any type of quantum computing like this. However, you can see that there's a, there's been a tremendous exponential growth in the qubit lifetime along the years. And now we are really at this stage where we can do tens of thousands of operations before we have an error from the finite lifetime of the qubit. Um, so this has really shown me or, or convinced me that in future, uh, we may be able to actually build a large-scale quantum computer out of these circuits and do uh, large-scale computing. Um, so this has been kind of a history of getting rid of the environment, right? Um, but, when I, but let's see that but this, this environment is not the only thing that is giving the errors. So actually, we are now so well decoupled from the errors from the environment and also other errors starts to play a role. So you have to be very accurate in also making the single qubit operations, turning qubit from zero to one, and, and also in coupling the qubits. So, and you may have heard that actually now the superconducting qubit technology is at the threshold where you can start to do quantum error correction in a way that uh, is more efficient than not doing it in the first place. So you can start to correct for errors uh, while preserving the coherence. Uh, so this was published about a year ago by the Martinez group uh, in Nature. And these are kind of the, uh, uh, the sort of uh, not, uh, figures of merit. So they can do single qubit measurement with 99.8% fidelity very fast. One qubit operations, two qubit operations. And these are the relaxation times and time and defacing time. And they, well, they are not in 10, 10 milliseconds, but they are still very long compared to the operation times. So, but actually, you need all of these to be done very precisely to be able to do the, to do the error correction and so-called fault error and quantum computing where, uh, where things start to uh, pay off. So in this paper, they said that now the superconducting quantum computer is at the threshold. And what does the threshold mean? It means that in this plot, we are actually here. We are just at the threshold where the single step error, the error may come from, from decoherence, may come from these gates, from the measurement, but the single step error is really uh, at the threshold. This is threshold error. And at the threshold, if you can't really do fault tolerant quantum computing yet because you need this is the redundancy that Charlie was talking about. You need infinite number of qubits, physical qubits, to, to encode a logical qubit to actually get the error down. So you want to be more accurate than what we are presently now here. You want to be one order or two orders of magnitude more accurate. So if you, if you, for example, are two orders of magnitude below the threshold, then just using 20 qubits, you can have a single qubit operation with 10 to minus 5. Uh, in the error, or if you increase the number of qubits, the, the, the error in the logical operation starts to go uh, down exponentially. So this is how the fault and quantum computing works. But what I'm saying is that 99.9% .9 fidelity is not enough. We have to be even more precise than that. And uh, the question is that, for example, how to initialize the qubits very fast or, and very precisely. And that is something that was actually not in these figures of merit. They actually assumed uh, a certain type of initialization. And um, my answer to this is that, of course, you could measure your qubit and flip it. Uh, however, um, maybe a more precise and, and an elegant way would be this. To have, well, so this is, this is a processor that is cooled by a huge cooling fin. 
So could you actually implement these cooling fins uh, into, into the qubits themselves on the chip and make the uh, initialization that way, to take off the excess heat when you want to take it off uh, with this environment? And having said that, I thank you. And uh, you have four minutes for a coffee. Well, thank you, Miko. Is there a quick question before coffee? Yep. Okay, very simple question. Uh, I'm not in this field, but um, what can you, how do you compare? Where was the, what year was silicon the same as qubit now? What year was the silicon calculation power same as the system right now? Because you can do, I guess, some, uh, some commercial uh, devices exist, some quantum computers. So silicon started okay. something, and what year is you now? So, Comparing to silicon. Like I said, at the moment, this traditional sort of gate-based quantum computing, we have less than, there is less than 10 qubits. 10 qubits. So, it's, it's, so the paper last year was with, with a 5-qubit processor. So that is quite a small number. However, uh, this has been done in a way that um, people have really studied in detail all of the individual qubits and how to couple them. You will hear uh, Colin to give you to talk about this adiabatic quantum computer of D-Wave, where they have more than 500 qubits that are also coupled, but it's a different scheme. So I think uh, it is, there are these different steps how to f finally achieve a quantum computer. And now we are at the, as I said, we are at the quantum error correction threshold. So the individual components are so good that if we get them a little bit better by putting many of these together and, and doing quantum error correction, we start to get uh, benefit. We start to get a logical qubit that is of very high fidelity, much better fidelity than the individual components themselves. This kind of error correction is also done on classical computers, otherwise they wouldn't work, right? So, so we are in that step in this traditional quantum computing, and, uh, and then having many logical qubits is, is a different story. So, but, uh, but I'm very convinced. I mean, if you look into the <laughs> 10 years in the past, I showed you in the graph that we have progressed so much, that, and we still need, we need only so little uh, better to, uh, to achieve those uh, nice error counts. So that I'm pretty convinced that we will get there, and now it's question is that what can we do uh, in the CQE to, uh, to get us there faster. All right, thank you, Miko. So let's thank Miko again.